I'm thankful for Calvary. That word is only found once in the Bible, Calvary, in the book of Luke. But that's the center of all history. And uh, we're so thankful for what the Lord Jesus did there and what He means to us and what He did for us. I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, as we've read already at the beginning of the service, is uh, an amazing passage. We've been preaching through the book of Philippians and just taking out phrases from the book on Sunday mornings. But uh, I wonder if it's fresh to you this morning. You know, I remember uh, when I was eight years old and um, the pastor preaching about the cross, you know, really, really struck me. But does it still strike you? Does it still hit you when, you're, when you hear about the Lord Jesus on the cross and about that empty tomb? I don't think we, we really uh, quite appreciate sometimes the shock and the, and, the, and, the, and the joy that the disciples and the women must have felt when they saw Jesus alive again. And uh, their faith had seemed to have been uh, buried as well. And yet then on Easter morning, Jesus Christ brought it back out of the tomb with, him, with himself. And uh, their, their faith was, was restored in God, giving victory over death. And uh, in Jesus Christ being the Messiah, being our substitute on the cross. And all of that was restored. But I remember my third grade teacher, when I was eight years old, she had us memorize this passage. And I still remember it. I can still remember it all these years later. And I remember th she, she explained each verse, and, and each week we would add a little bit more, a little bit more. And it's amazing what children can do. And it's amazing. Uh, how, <laughs> it makes me feel guilty now, thinking how much the Bible I memorize now. But, but we, can, we, can, we all should love the Bible, be memorizing the Bible. But, it, <clears throat> but uh, you know, there was a problem in, in the church at Philippi. And uh, there weren't very many problems that Paul mentions here in, uh, uh, in this book about the Philippians. Um, not many at all. But there was one, and that was there was some striving going on. Later on he talks about two women who are striving with one another and fighting with one another. And it was causing a division in the church. And so Paul wrote a letter to the Christians there at Philippi a city in Macedonia, the first church in Europe, uh, while he was in jail. So he's writing this while he's in jail. And the letter is to encourage them to remain faithful and to rejoice in God no matter what, to have joy no matter what. And uh, in this letter, he's urging the Philippians to adopt the same attitude as, as Jesus. The same attitude as our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who um, here... In his death on the cross is the ultimate example that the world has ever seen. We know Jesus Christ died on the cross. And if you will, if you will look at verse number 8, and that's where I'm going to focus in on today. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. It goes on to say, wherefore also hath God highly exalted him. Of course, he did rise again from the death that he died. And uh, he's given him a name which is above every name. And so this, uh, this example of Jesus Christ on the cross, it should, uh, uh, should cause us to do two things. To do two things. It says in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things, under the, and of things in earth and of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see those two verbs there that he tell, says that we're supposed to do in response to this? What Jesus did, this, this, this unique view of what Jesus did that we celebrate here at Easter, he says we should bow. We should bow our knees to him. And we will bow our knees. Every knee will one day bow. But... He, he, he's worthy of us bowing to Him even now. And in life, we should, we should be willing. And, and His example on the cross should cause us to have the, the same attitude of humility and of obedience. And uh, it should also cause us to um, confess. One day we'll be confessing in heaven. We'll be worshiping in heaven. But what about now in this life? 
Is there, are you going to live in light of the resurrection now? Are you going to live in light of it? Are you going to be confessing Him now? Are you going to be... The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then in the next verse says, whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed. So if, you, if you've never believed, and the Bible says whosoever shall call shall be saved. You can believe even today. Uh, but, but if you have believed, have you, put your, have you confessed Him before men? Have you... Last week we had a baptism service, and, and we had two folks who were confessing and, and uh, sharing their testimony, and we can be doing these things even now. You know, this Easter event, it's, uh, it's a picture of, of Jesus Christ coming. And this passage tells us that Jesus, there's two things that we see here in Jesus Christ. It says here in verse 8, "...and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself." He humbled himself. You see, there's the picture that the world maybe sees of Jesus, and that's from the earthly perspective of Jesus and his human life. He humbled himself. He became a man without ceasing to be God. And uh, he, he became one of us in order that he could die for our sins, and yet uh, he, was, he was more than a man. He had an everlasting life. He had been around from everlasting. Micah 5, 2, it promised. We quote at Easter, I mean at Christmas. And it says uh, that the child born in Bethlehem shall be from old, from everlasting. 400 years before he was born, he, he, that was prophesied about him. That he'd be, so he would be born and he'd be from everlasting. And so we see two things happening. We see the, um, uh, we see the uh, forever and ever Jesus. And then we see the Jesus that came down into, and came down into time. And that moment in time. And uh, we see both, both sides of him in this passage here. He, he was 100% man, and yet he was at the same time 100% God. You know, like the Word of God, the Bible. It's a, written by man. It was, it was written by man, and yet it was written by God. It's, uh, it's, so same thing with Jesus. It was 100%, he was 100% man and 100% God. And, uh, you know, he says here in this passage, May that heavenly view of Easter, may that... that Heaven word view may it be a refreshing view. May it be a view that you may may not have as you came in the doors this morning. And may you leave with that view of, of what Jesus really did in stepping out from heaven. And uh, may may it really capture each one of us. And may it capture us in such a way that it affects us. That it affects our life and how we live even now. It will affect our eternity for sure. If you put your faith in Jesus, or if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, it affects your eternity, what you do with Him. But it should affect your life now. You will one day bow your knee, whether you like it or not. Every knee shall bow, it says, and every tongue will confess. But it'll, it should affect us even now. You know, it should affect our, our life. Look at, look at the first few verses of this passage. It says, If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Of course, there is consolation in Christ. There is comfort of His love that He showed us. There is fellowship that we have with the Spirit, with God. And that's all through Jesus. The bowels and the mercies that we think about when we look at Jesus on the cross. Those do exist. So, in other words, He says, because they do exist, fulfill ye my joy, be like-minded. Be like-minded. Having the same love. The same love. Um, we, we share in that love. We share in that love that He gave us, being of one mind, of, of one accord, of one mind. And that says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That word strife there, uh, the, the Greek word has to do with striving for a political office. And uh, you know that there's a lot of strife when people are striving for political office. And I take off the punching gloves and they really go at it and they really sling the mud. He says, I don't want there to be any of that in the church. None of that politics, none of that uh, strife, none of that vain glory or that pride, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Circle that little word, better, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible. Better. I remember that standing out to me um, just, a, just maybe about three or four years ago as I read that verse. And I haven't really thought of that. Thinking of others better than myself? Well, I might think of them as the same level, but better. And then it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And if you, if you like to circle the word others and draw a line between others and better, you know, thinking of others better than yourself. 
and uh, and yet we're we're all in the same plane. We're all in the same boat. We all need Jesus, and yet He came and died for us. He didn't have to do that. It says, "Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus." So we see that Christ is not is is, not, is our all in chapter one. He's our all, but in chapter two of Philippians, Christ should be our attitude. He should be our aim and our attitude. Here we have an attitude, and then later on he's going to talk about how he should be our aim. And in chapter 3, he's going to be our, our aspiration. And in chapter 4, he's going to be our abundance. But, but Jesus Christ should be our attitude, the same attitude as him. Now, when we go to the sea, and I'm sure some of, some of the folks might be going to the sea uh, for bank holiday weekend, you know, on Monday. I'm sure there are lots of folks heading there right now. But you see the, um, the, the waves crashing. And uh, it's a, you know it's a bit like the Easter story. You know the, the waves are coming and going, and yet you see it for a moment of time, and yet it's it's been the same water going back and forth over and over. It comes, then it goes back out, and then it comes and goes back out. It just keeps going, and so the same as this story, this great event. It happened in a moment of time, but it began before the start of time. It began and extends beyond the end of time, and uh, it's it's about a forever and ever story about Jesus Christ. It's, it's both. And uh, of course as, you, as you're walking along in the sea you might see some seashells, you might pick those up and uh, you know you see those little shells with the... Uh, you know I, I never seem to be able to find them together but uh, you see them in two pieces you know. And uh, so there we have it. There's, there's the, the Lord Jesus Christ. God created us as well in the image of God and we're supposed to be together we're, we're created for his pleasure for his glory to be with him uh, the Bible says in Genesis 1 27 that God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them and, and we're created in God's image we're supposed to reflect that image we're supposed to be like Jesus we're supposed to have the same attitude as let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus we're supposed to reflect that and then he, but but of course you know that we've been touched. We still have a little bit of the image of God and this creation has a little bit of, you can see a little bit of the beauty in creation, but something's wrong with the world. And uh, sin came into the world. The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 12, there is none righteous, no, not one. And we were separated from God. And we were marred. That image was marred. And, um, you know, and, and yet the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It says in, in Psalm 139, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And so we, we were created, he made us for that, and he wants to reconcile us to himself. And you've seen me do the illustration before, but uh, you know God wants to be with us forever, but sin separates us from God. I think I've done this once before, but sin separates us from God. And so... There's nothing you can do to get to heaven. It's, we're separated. We've, we've been broken apart. And so what happened? You can't get rid of that sin by turning over a new leaf. You can't get rid of your sin by doing good works. You can't get rid of your sin by, if your good works that way or bad works, or going to church or being baptized. or You can get baptized in the Neen River until all the tadpoles know your national insurance number. You know, but, but that won't forgive your sins. You know, You have to have something else. And that's what... To Lord Jesus Christ did. He became a man so that he could take your sin on the cross. And it was fully put on him. He died for it. He was buried. He, he buried your sin. He paid for it. And so then, once again, you can be with God. If you put your faith in him, you can be with him. And then, But also, besides that, you should reflect him. You should, you should try to let that mind be in you. And may it affect us. May it affect us this day. May it affect us this week. It may affect us all the rest of our lives. May we not forget the resurrection of Christ, the, the death of Christ for us, and all that it means in making us reconciled to God and trying to make us more like God, more like Christ. And that's the goal. We're going to be completely free from sin one day. We're, we're, we're justified. That's the beginning. And you have to be justified to go to heaven. Uh, you're saved from the penalty of sin. Uh, but then... So you need to be sanctified. You're saved from the power of sin. I don't think you'll ever be completely free from sin in this life because um, I, I, I believe that we sin every day. I believe that it, everything that we know to do good, that do it not, and do it not, that, that's sin, the book of James says. 
So even that, even things we don't do, we, we sins of commission, there's sins of omission. And so we, we commit sin, we break God's law. And then we don't do things that we know to do, that's right, that's the other sins, sins of omission. And so we can never be completely free from that, but, but over time, sanctification and the Holy Spirit coming inside of us makes us more and more like Christ. And we're safe from the power of sin. And then one day we'll be safe from the presence of sin. That'll be glorification, get our glorified bodies, and uh, you'll be with Him forever. You'll, you'll share in that forever and ever story of Jesus Christ. So aren't you glad that forever and ever Jesus became the, the in-time Jesus? He became a man. He humbled Himself. And uh, he, he obeyed. It says He became obedient unto death in verse 8. It says, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Now that word humble gets a lot of people off track. They say he, he humbled himself, he, he, he emptied himself. And uh, he emptied himself of, of, of his Godhead. But that's not true. He didn't empty himself of his Godhead. He didn't humble himself in that way. He, he emptied himself perhaps a bit of his glory. He, 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 but he was able to reveal that glory at the Mount of Transfiguration. He was able to reveal that. So he didn't empty himself of, of his deity. He emptied himself of his glory, a bit of his glory, but but he humbled himself in that way, and uh, we, he became a man, as I said, without ceasing to be God, and uh, he was co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and with God the Holy Spirit, and uh, in that in that fashion, as a servant, as a man, he says he was obedient. He was obedient, and in, in obeying Christ. He didn't have to do it. He didn't have to. Um, uh, he he didn't have to uh, completely uh, die for our sins, but he willingly did that. He was obedient to what the Father's will was, and uh, we see that he was obedient to the Father all through his life. He was the only one who ever was. He's the only one who ever never committed a sin of co of commission or omission. He never committed any sin. And uh, at twelve years old, you know he. Uh, he showed his earthly parents that he had another voice that he was responding to. He said, uh, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? That's what I'm doing. And his obedience, um, he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was crying, Father, you know, it, you know, anything's possible for you, and if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, Not my will, but thine be done. You know, we sing that song, Who am I that he would pray, Not, not my will thine for it. Who am I that he would come and die for? The answer, I may never know why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go, for who am I? And, uh, you know, that he, but he did. He came. He obeyed. Now, there's lots of people who... Now, we should be, we should be reflecting Christ also in that obedience, shouldn't we? Uh, but there's lots of people that um, they obey for the wrong reasons. And they obey the wrong people. They obey the voices of other, of other, they obey other voices and not God's voice. You know, in the 1950s, there was a psychologist named Stanley Milgram, and he carried out an experiment to see how far people would go in being obedient to commands. And he, he, he brought his studies into a room, and he, he placed um, participants in this room, and he di directed them to deliver electric shocks to a learner located in another room. And, uh, you know, they could see the other person. And they could see this, but the, the other person was an actor. He wasn't really being shocked, but he was responding to, to what the people were telling him in an earpiece. And so they, they found out that 60% of the participants were willing to obey and deliver the maximum level of pain and shocks uh, to the exper at the order of the person doing the experiments. You know, people do terrible things. And they say, well, I was just following orders. You know, we think about this past week, the terrorists in Brussels. And uh, they, 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 what were they doing? They were being obedient to orders. Of course, they're following the wrong orders. They're following uh, what they believe are the orders of the Koran. And, uh, you know, they're following the orders of some cell group somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful that we follow a different book. You know, people accuse us of being fundamentalists. You know, they talk about fundamental... Islamic extremists, you know, but, but we are fundamentalists, uh, but we're fundamental about something totally different. 
And our command is totally different. Our command is written up here on the back wall. And our command is to preach the gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The love that he showed and that we're to show. That's our commands. And so, Jesus Christ, he was obedient unto death. He was obedient through his life. He was obedient unto death. The love of God was on display uh, in that he, he was obedient to that. And uh, even though we humans can never be obedient to all that God desires for his creatures, we need a Savior who was. And so Jesus was obedient because we couldn't be. You know, we, we sing that song, In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have. And uh, he listened to, to, he was obedient to that, to that love, that love of God. And, but whose voice are we listening to as we go through life? We can listen to voices of authority, of power, voices that coerce us, you know. Uh, but, or are we listening to that voice of love that echoes down, that was on display on the cross of Calvary, that echoes down through the centuries from that hill. And our obedience can then be a joyful obedience. It can be a joyful response of gratitude. We don't serve God in order to be saved, do we? We, we like, like other religions do, they're trying to earn points with God and gain favor with God. We serve God not in order to be saved, but because we're thankful that we are saved, and it becomes joyful, joyful obedience. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that it says, uh, Wherefore, laying aside every way and sin that so easily besets, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy on the cross, he had joy. The joy that was set before him, that it was set before his eyes on the cross, what caused him to walk up that hill with the cross on his back. The joy that was set before him, he did that. He endured the cross. And that's what it says here in Philippians 2, verse 8. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. Why did Jesus Christ die? And, and that, that's the title of the message, the death of the cross. Why did Jesus, we see uh, his humiliation there, the ultimate humiliation on the cross. And, uh, you know, I, I, I preached before about the details of Jesus Christ on the cross and, and the pain that he went through and the agony he went through. And the, but it was the humiliation that he went through. The Bible says it's a curse. The Bible says in, in Exodus, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And that's, that's quoted in the New Testament. You know, but he became a curse for us. He became a curse. He, he was humiliated. The Bible tells us that they, they, took, they stripped him of his garments. They, they, they bedded over those garments. They uh, took, took those off, and it was one without any seam, and they, they were fulfilling the prophecies about how they would gamble over his, his clothes. But he was up there, humiliated. You know, we think about movies, and, but it was beyond anything we can imagine or anything we've ever seen. Yeah, and the humiliation that was there as he hung, uh, exposed there on that cross. And uh, he did that for you, the humiliation of it all. But why did he do that? Why did he do that? There are some people who would say it was just as a good example. But it wasn't. It was much more than that. Why did Jesus have to die? Uh, it's, uh, you know, Christianity is very distinct. The doctrine of the death of Christ, uh, you know, it's... It, uh, uh, it's the supreme revelation of God to us. It's, uh, it's redemption. God was redeeming us. He was forgiving us. There was so much involved there on the cross that day. So many things. He was redeeming us. He was buying us. Some people have the idea that he, he, he died and then he paid the devil some money. He was redeeming us. But he didn't have to pay the devil any money. That's not what he was doing when he redeemed us. Uh, he was redeeming us with his blood. He was paying the price for our sin to justify and satisfy God the Father. There's a, another song that we sing sometimes. Um, i trying to find it here. Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die. Upon another's death, another's life, I risk my soul's eternity. And that's what it was. He was dying for us. Upon a death I did not die, upon a life I did not live, he was dying as a substitution. That's what it was. It wasn't just... Uh, it wasn't just uh, the, these modern ideas of, of uh, Jesus Christ coming uh, 
and, and it was just an accident, a terrible accident that Jesus died on the cross. That's what some people would want you to think. But he was a real person, he did, but he came and he, he, he died a real death, but it was not an accident. He said uh, in um, John chapter 10, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, John 10, 17, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He was laying it down willingly. Uh, he was conscious all the time of his coming death. He foretold it over and over and over again. He was always conscious of the plots against his life. And, uh, you know, there's so many scriptures. I, th I believe there's uh, at least six or uh, six or seven times Jesus said that he was going to die. And he even said how he was going to die. He knew what manner of death he would die. And he, he knew he would be crucified. He knew he would be scourged. He told all these things. And, of course, it wasn't just him that prophesied it. We could also mention all the Old Testament prophecies uh, to the fact of Christ's death. And uh, some people, th so it wasn't an accident. He wasn't just a martyr. Some people say he was a, a martyr like, uh, uh, like uh, William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English, or other people. It was a, a great cause or a great principle. But Jesus Christ never called himself a martyr. Paul never called him a martyr. He was our Savior. The Bible says um, he was atoning for us. And, uh, you know, he was, he was doing it with the joy set before him. And, uh, of course, Jesus Christ, um, he, he was, for, he was uh, uh, unique. Nobody said that you could be saved because of the death of Stephen, or you could be saved because of the death of Paul or Peter, but you could be saved because of the death. Of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just a martyr. He wasn't just a good example. He was a good example. He's the greatest example, as we've been saying. But that's not all he was. He was much more than that. And it, it has a great influence on us. And there's lots of applications that come out of it. But he died in order to save us. He's granting forgiveness and pardon. And there are lots of moral impl impl implications that can come out of it if you are like him. But there's much more than that. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many things... He wasn't just dying, he was, he was dying also uh, to show the love of God for us. You know, th there's no other greater example than the love of God. There's no other great example of the justice and wrath of God either, though. But the love of God caused Jesus to become a man and die in our place. He was our substitute. He died a substitutionary death. The Bible says in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Isaiah 53, verse 6, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Remember that phone that I had? It was All that sin was laid upon Christ. And he paid for it all together, all at once. He, the Bible calls him the Lamb. What did G, John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was our substitute. He was our uh, Passover Lamb. It says in the book of Hebrews, he was our Passover lamb. The Bible says uh, that um, he willingly went. He, 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 not by force, but he became our willing substitute. Just like um, Isaiah, I mean, just like Abraham took his son Isaac, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, but then there was a ram caught in the thicket. That, that, uh, but he was Galgotha's ram. Jesus Christ was. He was our substitute. He was our scapegoat. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, he, he gave us the very best. He, there's nobody else who could do that for us. Nobody else could be our substitute except for Jesus Christ. He was also our reconciliation. He was our substitute. He was our reconciliation. Just think of those two pieces of the shell coming back together. We're reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled to God, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, the Bible talks about how we're reconciled to God by the death of His Son, by His cross, and by the blood of His cross. That's the message of the Scriptures. We're reconciled to God. But also, He's a propitiation. The Bible says in 1 John 2.2, 2, uh, it tells us that um, He died as a propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation, is, it's not a difficult word. Uh, if, you, if you know what it means, it just means the satisfaction. And He satisfied God the Father on our behalf. 1 John 2, verse 2, 
and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. All of your sins were future when Jesus died for them. And he became the propitiation for not just all of your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. They were all laid upon him. All the sins from the past, the Old Testament saints, were rolled forward onto Christ. All of the sins from the future were rolled onto Christ. And he paid for them all together at once. And Jesus Christ was satisfied. It, he was, it was covered. Our sins were covered. They were the propitiation. Uh, it, the, the word propitiation means a covering. And, and over the top of the Ten Commandments on the Ark of the Covenant, there was a, a covering and where two angels touched their wings together and they were guarding the holiness of God. And yet that's where they sprinkled the blood of the Passover lamb every year as a covering for those sins, the sin that broke those Ten Commandments that were sitting in that Ark of the Covenant. And so Jesus Christ, He is our actual covering for that sin. It's completely covered by His blood. He's the propitiation. And so the death of Christ says that a righteous God can be satisfied for us. And it, He also, as I said, was our ransom. He wasn't paying the devil for us, but He was buying us back. He, the Bible says that He was the Lamb. And in Revelation, it says, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, who hath redeemed us to God by His blood, and hath power and wisdom and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So Jesus Christ, He is the Redeemer. He has redeemed us by that death. So all these things happened when Jesus died on the cross. And He, he paid. He paid for you. you. There's the idea of redeeming a land. And nobody could open that title deed to the earth in the book of Revelation. Nobody could be found worthy to open the seven seals. You know, if I had a piece of land and, and I said uh, uh, only a, there's all these seven seals, seven qualifications you have to have to open this, and nobody was, was able to open those seven seals and redeem the earth. But then they said, worthy is the Lamb, He can do it. But He's not only redeeming this earth, He's redeeming you. You know, you, you could also redeem slaves in the, in, the, in the idea of if somebody was a slave on the slave market of sin, then you could uh, go and you could pay and redeem them with money and then you can set them free. And that's what Jesus Christ did. But He redeemed us not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. That's what Jesus did. And all those things, He, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The cross is where all these things have happened. If it wasn't for the cross, it wasn't for that death. I, it's amazing that He was able to do that. Uh, in those six hours, redeem all of us on that cross and all the sins laid upon him. But of course, he's God. He could have could have done it in less than six hours, I suppose. But but that's that's what it, that's what happened. He died for you on that cross. And now it says he humbled himself. He emptied himself of all but love. Uh, he he was still God. He didn't empty, didn't empty himself of his deity, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself, and so now we don't have to be empty. You know, he, now because he died on that cross, now it's an empty cross, isn't it? He's no longer on that cross. And uh, the, what's one of the greatest symbols of Easter is that empty cross. But what's the even greater symbol of Easter? And I'm thankful for Grace and Erica. They've drawn, uh, they made this before they went on their trip to Hinkley this, this weekend. But they've drawn, drawn the empty tomb there for us. And that's the greatest symbol of new life found in an empty tomb. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he, 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 the Bible says, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. We can, we can, uh, you might have had an empty life before, but now you can be emptied of yourself and be filled with him. Be, be emptied of your own ambitions in life and be filled with him. And uh, allow that mind to be in you as a Christian. The empty tomb allows you to be full. Uh, then also, it allows you to, to have an abundant life. You can be full. You can. Uh, Jesus said, "I the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy." John ten ten. But I am come that ye might have life. That ye might have it more abundantly. He poured all that he had out, that it might be found within us. He, he's giving it to us. And uh, we watch him living on the earth, and uh, he was living as an, uh, in, in a way that he, in a perfect way of obedience, and now we can, we can let that same mind be in us. 
and uh, we serve Him. We serve uh, not just an empty, an empty idea. And so many for it, for Easter is just an empty holiday, isn't it? But for us, it's not empty. It's full because of the empty tomb. And uh, he, he, we need to be emptied of sin, though. We need to be emptied of self. We need to empty, emptied of any substitutes that might try to get you um, uh, t distracted from him. You know, the Martha, Martha was busy with all sorts of things. You know, we, we might be very busy today trying to get our nice outfits on for Easter or get busy trying to uh, make dinner or busy trying to get the kids up or busy doing all sorts of things. But uh, Jesus said to Martha, 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 thou art cumbered about with many things, but one thing is needful. And don't get distracted by all those other things and miss uh, the main thing, the, the, the more important thing. And there's no substitute for him. You can't fill it, fill it with drugs or with food or with movies or with relationships or with music or nothing else but Jesus can fill that. And we just need to... Maybe tonight, you, maybe this morning, you just need to ask Lord to empty you of any toxic waste that's built up. <laughs> and uh, He can do that. He can cleanse you. And he can fill you. And that empty cross is there. That empty tomb is there uh, to, to prove that He lives and that you can live also. So it's not about an empty holiday. It's about an empty tomb. I hope you've been able to see that empty tomb afresh this morning with the eyes, the eternal eyes. That Jesus Christ was the ever-living, eternal Son of God who became the end-time Son of God, who, who died for us. And uh, the world will just give you empty promises, but God gives you an empty tomb full of promises. That's what we need. Let's pray together, maybe. Our Lord, our Lord, Father, we thank you so much for our Savior and the great love that's shown there. That's been proven there. Thank you for the power that he had as the perfect Son of God, your Son, to conquer death, to rise again from the dead, to, to be alive forever and ever. And help us never to forget that. Help us never to forget your presence with us, even today. Help us to remember that you're with us whenever we go through perplexities. You're with us to give us eternal, uh, not only to give us eternal life, but to help us in this life. You're with us. In times of sorrow, you're with us when we're tempted and when we're lonely. And you're with us even when we die to bring us to, to be with you forever and ever. And so, Father, we ask that you help us to remember that. And remember the hope and the joy that we have this day. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, may we?